Hey everyone, thank you for being here today. Chamber of Progress is honored to welcome you all to our press briefing today on the recent social media addiction litigation. I'm Jess Myers and I'm Legal Advocacy Counsel for Chamber of Progress. Chamber of Progress is a tech industry coalition devoted to a progressive society. We back public policies that will build a fairer, more inclusive country in which all people benefit from technological leaps. While our partner companies are party, our parties to the lawsuits we'll be discussing today, Chamber of Progress and our views do not represent our partner companies, nor do our partner companies have a vote or veto over our own positions. Um, here with me today are lawyers and experts who have closely followed these cases and thought deeply about their implications. I'm going to start with Kathy Gellis. Kathy Gellis is a lawyer in private practice who regularly writes about these issues in legal briefs and as a contributor on TechDirt. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Um, and next is Eric Goldman. Eric Goldman is Associate Dean for Research, Professor of Law, Co-Director of the High Tech Law Institute, and Supervisor of the Privacy Law Certificate at Santa Clara University School of Law. Um, thank you for being here, both of you. Did I miss anything? Excellent, excellent. Um, so during the first half of today's briefing, I'm gonna ask some questions of our panelists, and then during the second half of, of the event, we're gonna turn to audience questions. Uh, but before we turn our panel discussion over, I'm going to kick things off with a little background on the cases we're discussing today. So starting out with NRA social media adolescent addiction. So during the past fall, multiple school districts and private plaintiffs from across the nation filed separate complaints against social media giants, including Google, Meta, Snap, and TikTok. Um, subsequently, these lawsuits were consolidated and brought under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation, which is a specialized body within the federal court system responsible for overseeing um, complex litigation such as this one. Um, Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers, who's based in the Northern District of California, is presiding over this federal MDL. The cases share similar facts and issues, alleging that these social media companies have designed their platforms in ways that foster addiction among minors and students. This litigation strategy and the specific allegations echo those seen in previous challenges against industries like tobacco and gambling. So that's the federal district MDL. Moving on, um, meanwhile, on October 13th, the Superior Court of the State of California for Los Angeles County issued a ruling in a distinct legal challenge as well. This case involved personal injury lawsuits filed by private plaintiffs against the social media companies, and it dealt with the question of whether negligence, defective design, and other claims could proceed independently of Section 230 in the First Amendment. The court's decision was specific. It determined that Section 230 did not apply to claims related to the flawed design and operation of the, of the platforms, um, as these claims do not involve third-party content. We'll come back to that. It is anticipated that the social media defendants will soon appeal this ruling. And then last but not least, this is the most recent one we have so far. In the preceding month, a bipartisan coalition of 42 attorneys general initi initiated legal actions against Meta, asserting compar uh, comparable addiction-related uh, allegations. So at the heart of these complaints lies the uh, uh, allegation that Meta intentionally crafted Facebook and Instagram to prolong the engagement of younger users on their platforms and to ensure they keep returning. Notably, 33 of these lawsuits have been filed in the Northern District of California, while the remaining cases represent distinct challenges brought forth by different states. So that's the, that is where we're at right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dive into some questions for our panelists. And Kathy, I wanted to start with you. Can you share a few words about the pros and cons of this multi-district litigation? Um, you know, some of the defendant companies actually oppose the joint litigation. Do, do you have thoughts on why that might be? So there's some sense of if you've got a lot of very similar things happening in many places, it just from a pure logistical standpoint, it would make sense to consolidate them so that they can happen once instead of multiple times and be more likely to reach the same end in each instance as opposed to contrary ends. So for instance, um, one defendant versus one plaintiff, this multi-district litigation is primarily intended to deal with um, the upfront booting up into a trial type uh, questions like discovery. And when you have discovery, you have 
motion here, motion there. I want these people to produce something. I want you to make them stop making me produce it. So you get a lot of arguments and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if those arguments that are going to be very similar based on similar type documents, similar type of in interrogatories or discovery demands are adjudicated in multiple courts in multiple places with multiple rules of civil procedure and you don't get the same answer. Uh, even if you've got the same answer, that's obviously costly, and there's also the danger that you'd get a different answer, in which case, if one court says, oh, yes, you're protected, you don't have to disclose this, and another court says, but you do have to disclose it to the exact same plaintiff, where you have accomplished nothing. So it does make some sense from, if you're going to have to go through this process, fine, make it more efficient. But on the other hand, um, one of the things and there is... We aren't just talking about similar claims brought against one defendant. We are talking about similar claims brought against multiple defendants who are not equally situated and who are also competitors for whom discovery and the sharing of discovery creates some competition issues. Um, and uh, some of the smaller social media uh, defendants push back on it to say, hang on a second, like for us, it would because they aren't necessarily, even, they may not even be named as some defendants in certain cases, and for a variety of reasons, the upside that, for instance, Meta will experience by having it compromised is not necessarily an upside that the other social media defendants are going to experience, especially being brought into the same lawsuit. And then you also get into the question of, these are not identical lawsuits, they're not identical claims, they're not identical jurisdictions with identi truly identical laws, and even some of the core facts may not actually be the same. So you, there's an awful lot of conflating that's happening by scooping everything up and putting it all in one bucket. Some efficiencies, but also some really important nuance also stands to get lost. Thanks so much for that. And I mean, I'll add as well, the way that the platforms all operate, they operate very differently. Some of the things that are complained about for some of the features, say, on Facebook may not even be available on, say, TikTok or Snap. Plus, the user bases are different, too, as we've seen. The, the young users are actually declining on, Facebook's, uh, on Facebook and Instagram versus some of the other products at issue here. So. And the plaintiffs as well. I mean, even if you've just got school districts, school districts are not all the same. And I don't think it's just school districts. So you have different situated people bring different situated things. The only thing in common is they're all mad at social media, but I'm not entirely sure that's enough of a nexus to justify um, this huge expensive process that we are now dumping on the courts and dumping on all these defendants to have to deal with. Right. Well, with that, let's go to Professor Goldman. Uh, Professor Goldman, can you go ahead and discuss some of these core allegations that are shared across these lawsuits? Let's go ahead and unpack those. Um, you know, where do these claims intersect? And are there any distinct allegations with any of the three uh, separate cases that have stood out to you? So uh, the um, private lawsuits have a lot in common. They they cover very similar set of um, concerns and many of the same types of causes of action. Um, the AG lawsuits um, are a qualitatively different type of litigation because of the fact that um, the AGs have different claims that they can bring, um, and they're representing a different client in a sense. They're representing the state in general or their constituents at large, as opposed to um, uh, to a specific plaintiff explaining their particular harms. Um, and uh, I think that much of the litigation in the private sphere is really just variations on the negligence theme. There's a lot of different ways for plaintiffs to describe the concerns they have. But at the core, I think, is just the standard argument that there's a harm, there was some duty on the part of the defendants to prevent that harm, and we should manufacture or extend the law to apply to that circumstance. This is something that's been going on for hundreds of years in the courts. Um, so it's something that courts deal with all the time. Um, and yet I think it really does sharpen up um, the idea, we don't allow every single person who claims that they're harmed to have access to the courts, no matter what particular type of cause of action they, they allege. And so um, negligence is not designed to be a general purpose, get vindication claim. There has to fit specific concerns in order to um, move forward. 
Um, in the California case, for example, uh, there's also allegations about Facebook's uh, concealment of uh, material information uh, to consumers, um, and there's other variations in the federal one as well. Um, the uh, the AG's claims include, I think, most notably, uh, the COPPA claim, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, um, essentially alleging that the services had an affirmative duty under COPPA to identify the age of their users and therefore screen out the underage ones or treat them um, uh, to the heightened duties imposed by the statute. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. We haven't seen a lot of COPPA enforcement generally. And so the fact that they're trying to figure out a way to make this law apply to this set of facts uh, strikes me as noteworthy. I honestly think that um, they, like in many of the complaints, private and AG, have overreached. Um, there is no affirmative duty to go and identify the age of users under COPPA. That's been clear for uh, over two decades. And so that's the kind of thing where when you see them reaching into the bag of tricks that deeply, it starts to make you wonder what the real motivation is. You know, speaking of the COPPA claim, I agree. I, I, I found that to be probably the most uh, standout of the claims. I, there seemed to be an implication or an allegation that age estimation efforts should confer actual knowledge under COPPA that, some, that a user is under 13. Do you know if that is something that we have seen before or is, would that be sort of an unprecedented uh, take? Just as a general matter, we don't have a lot of COP litigation over the years. Um, it's been a relatively lightly enforced law. And we haven't had very specific uh, um, litigation over this age determination question. When does someone know or not? In some of the cases, it's been entirely clear. There's been no dispute about it. I think about, for example, the Yelp enforcement action by the FTC, where the users provided their birth date. There wasn't a uh, there wasn't any ambiguity about whether or not Yelp knew the age of their users. They literally were told the age of users and didn't act upon the ones who were under age. Um, so the idea that some kind of automated mechanism for determining users' age would create actual knowledge of the statute is a legally untested theory, but it does subsume the bigger question of whether or not there's even affirmative duty to use some form of age authentication process at all. And for the first 20 plus years of the statute, the answer has always been, you don't have to do a damn thing in order to figure out the age of your users. COPPA doesn't uh, require it. And as a constitutional matter, no legislature could require it. That would be unconstitutional. So there, the state AG's position is basically trying to turn COPPA in, into a affirmative obligation that seems like it would directly conflict with the constitutional provisions that say you can't force online publishers to determine the age of their users. And so the whole thing actually should fail either because COPPA says something different or because if it says what they claim, then they've created a constitutional problem with COPPA. Kathy, I want to give you a chance to chime in. Yeah. Yeah, just to add, the COPPA claims are also really self-defeating. Because COPPA is basically stands as the, you don't get to elicit personal information from young people and then do something with it. Um, and we're going to decide that if you do that, it's deceptive practice and the FTC can come after you. Um, so it's a very bizarre state of affairs to say your COPPA liability is that you did not elicit enough personal information from your user. And therefore, you have liability because under the statute that gets mad at you when you take too much personal information from your user. So it, I'm reading the statute. I'm reading the the cause the complaint, and it's backwards. Like if they if the defendants had done more of what is being complained about, they would be in bigger trouble. Like it 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 doesn't make sense, and it does seem like a really significant misuse of COPPA because it does not seem to be chasing the sort of harm that COPPA was designed to chase, which is you just didn't want, you know, this permanent record of following young people around that they accidentally gave up without them realizing it. Um, but that's not really what the complaint is about. The complaint is about, um, you know, people use the internet and um, talk to each other and sometimes bad things happen as a result of those exchanges, but that's not the same thing. That's not an issue of personal information, and the complaint seems to say, well, one of the reasons you have liability is you did not extract enough personal information, and that just seems like 
bizarre because if they had done more, then I think they probably would have had more liability under COPPA, uh, let alone the other facially um, unconstitutional problems with demanding more personal information as, a, as an entrance obstacle to be able to use the internet at all. Excellent. I want to go ahead and turn to the LA County Superior Court uh, decision. What happened here? You know, this seems like it was supposed to be a slam dunk for Section 230. We're talking about underlying content. But of course, the, the pleading strategy here, as we've seen for some of a lot of these other similar similarly positioned uh, lawsuits, is to say that this is about the defective design of the platforms. This is about the way the platform operates, not about the underlying content. So that's how the court decided Section 230 and the First Amendment don't apply here. I'm going to throw this over to Professor Goldman to start. Any thoughts? It's quite a read. Um, <laughs> I've been trying to get a blog post out on it. It's the kind of post that takes me uh, like 10 hours to write because there's so much to analyze, to grok, to understand, to parse. And so much of it is just head scratching. But really at the core, it gets to something, to a, an issue that's a standard part of constitutional litigation. And I think a standard part of Section 230, this line between content and conduct. And in the court's mind, that the claims are not based on the content of third party users. The claims are based on the conduct of the social media services in engaging with their own users. And if you say it that way, it might make some sense. Okay, content should be regulated differently than the content that's being moved around. Um, the problem is it's an impossible distinction to make which is again, not unique, but certainly here, the court repeatedly just has to ignore obvious facts in order to reach this conclusion. And just take something like auto-scrolling. The court goes uh, repeatedly points to auto-scrolling um, uh, as a problem of conduct only. But the point is, what are people scrolling? They're scrolling content. And the only reason why it's a problem is because of the fact that they are consuming content. And so to say that auto-scrolling can be agnostic or divorced from the content that's being scrolled, I think creates this, this just logic puzzle that the court can never uh, fully solve. Um, and so the other thing that the court does is with respect to Section 230, which generally says that websites aren't liable for third party content, seems like it would apply to a set of circumstances here where the concerns are based on how users are talking to each other, the movement of content between users. And the court says that Section 230 only applies to particular items of content. We'd love to find a particular item that's causing harm and only then does Section 230 apply. And that's not in the statute. That's not how the courts have interpreted it all. The court just made that up. And with making up that new rule, then it becomes easier for them to say, well, we're not talking about individual content. We're talking about content writ large, this abstract thing called content. And section two there doesn't apply to abstract conceptions of content, only to specific items. And that distinction between particular items of content and content more generally is nowhere in the statute. And it really gives the court a way to disregard what I think are pretty obvious Section 230 defenses. Kathy, I want to give you a chance to chime in as well. Well, I have nothing nice to say about this decision either. Um, it's sort of like every time you look at it, you can just sort of look at a page of it and find a big problem. But um, like what Eric says, to find that, I mean, it's got First Amendment problems too, and they're somewhat inextricable from the same sort of problems that gave it Section 230 problems, uh, but it's got Section 230 problems. That statute should have made this case go away. Uh, one reason it should make it go away is uh, because the sort of tort liability being described here is, is necessarily a creature of state law, and Section 230 has a preemption provision to prevent states from being able to impose their law on the provision of internet services, because if they could all do it, then they would all do it differently and you would have a big problem and not be able to provide any sort of internet, interstate commerce type of internet service. So to be so, um, to just be sort of, uh, I forget the word that's coming to mind, sort of cavalier in the analysis about whether Section 230 applies, is extremely problematic because there's really important reasons why this law needs to apply and the court gives short shrift to it. It's sort of 
acknowledges it and talks about like some of the preamble text, but then kind of veers off and misses the point and says, oh, well, it's state law will probably apply. But it really has to kind of squint strangely and ignore an awful lot of precedent that it also acknowledges along the way in order to get there. And I think a couple of, you know, two big problems that I might call out are one, there's been a couple of cases um, that have found that Section 230 didn't apply to their particular set of facts. I think they are all probably problematic in their own way, um, where I think the courts got it wrong. And uh, just off the top of my head, I think they cite Barnes v. Yahoo, the Internet Brands case, um, Bolger v. Amazon. Um, there, I think there were maybe one or two others. Um, I think all of those cases are a disaster on their face and their facts, but they are also much narrower and not particularly applicable to these sets of facts. But the court kind of looks at the fact that exceptions have been found, so therefore there is nothing preventing me from finding that this goes into, um, into an exemption category where exemptions can be found lightly because they were found previously. And I think that's a really dangerous way for the courts to look at these questions, that if exceptions were found, um, they were found very specifically on their facts, on their faces, into an otherwise applicable law, and it's really incumbent on the courts to look more carefully. Um, a second problem, but there's kind of two sides to it, is the courts tend to miss that what they are dealing with is not a physical product, but speech. And this, this decision is weird because it actually gets something right, which at various points when it gets rid of the product's liability claims, acknowledges the, that this is not a physical product that we are talking about, and then completely dumps that rationale when it goes to apply its, its, its negligence understanding, where it treats it as a product, where you could have any sort of duties connected to the provision of your product. And that's um, that just misses what's going on, and it misses some really important things that the decision otherwise acknowledges, where the First Amendment and Section 230 allow for editorial discretion, and essentially what they are, what the plaintiffs are objecting to is editorial decisions made by the, the platforms to decide how they want to present their platform that their vehicle for people to use to speak to each other. Um, and that is, you know, at the heart of First Amendment protected activity for the platform, it's First Amendment protected ac activity for the users, and the court really just skips right over the fact that we are dealing with speech all the way down. It's speech from the users, it's speech from uh, the platforms, and you can't just treat this as a physical product, that's the wrong analysis. And then related to that is it's also missing that really what we're talking about and why it's 230 matters is we're really talking about user generated content which is at the heart of what section 230 well it doesn't protect the, the the user generated content but it protects the platform able to to make sure that they're able to facilitate that because if you think about what's going wrong like okay well why should we really care that kids are using the internet like what's going wrong well something's going wrong where you know, some of the engagement that they're having with expression is ending up being, you know, leaving a footprint that maybe society would rather not have have happen. Um, but that's a byproduct of, um, you know, the content that they're seeing and the content that they're saying was content that was put there by another user. If there was something wrong with the user, with the kids experience on the internet, it is because of content that some other person put there. And the court misses that level of extrapolation and just basically applies that, well, you, be, you built a platform, people could speak on it, and the fact that some of that speech turned out to be bad, therefore it's on you, but it also kind of doesn't even stick to that analysis because as Eric was saying, how dare you have, you know, infinite scrolling, but like with the court object, if it was like infinite scrolling of rainbows and unicorns, like is that similarly something that liability could attach to? Or is the problem that it wasn't just rainbows and unicorns and some, you know, less desirable stuff was there? Um, it really conflates too much. And the court is kind of like, well, we'll fight about it later. But fighting about it later is not supposed to happen. Section 230 is supposed to prevent the fight at all because it is so devastating and so depleting for a platform to have to defend, um, you know, even to get this far and to go further. And it's not just this complaint, but if this complaint can fly, then suddenly we're going to see lots of other complaints in lots of other jurisdictions, and we'll be back to our multi-district litigation when they all kind of form the, the next Voltron of, of, you know, litigation complexity. So 
Section 230 is supposed to say this is not supposed to happen at all because this is impossible for certainly less funded um, platforms than Facebook. And but quite frankly, all this stuff is going to put a strain on even a company as large and capitalized as Meta. I'm sorry, Jess, can I append to that just briefly? Um, I'd like to point out a particular passage from the opinion and, um, where the court says the defendants failed to explain a requirement our requirement that defendants change the design feature of their platforms would have a chilling effect on third party speech or distribution of such speech. Holding defendants responsible in tort for these addictive features doesn't defile, uh, violate the First Amendment, even if less content is delivered as a result. And I, to me, that just is so telling about where the court's head is at, that it sees no problem whatsoever with the fact that it's really might very well reduce the overall instance of content online. And the fact that it doesn't see how the, uh, quote, uh, changing the design features uh, would um, uh, constitute a chilling effect. Um, when, in fact, as Kathy just mentioned, there's money at, uh, at stake here. When I'm going to say my post, I'm going to call it um, drool worthy money. There's enough money for people to really, really care about. Um, and that's on both sides. Uh, and that absolutely changes people's behavior. And to have the threat of saying, you have to redesign your service or else you will be exposed to yet more money uh, strikes me as the kind of thing absolutely has a chilling effect, absolutely leads to less speech. And this court somehow says none of that constitutes a First Amendment concern. Sorry, guys. It looks like uh, Jess dropped up. Oh, Y'all hear me? Jess back. There <laughs> yeah. we go. Sorry, it was like the internet went down, which ironic. Um, anyways, okay, so yes, I will make two very quick points here, just my own personal observations as, as watching these cases. I agree, plus one to both of you. Um, I think, you know, the first thing for me, it really, what I found really bizarre was some of the arguments that were brought by the AGs with regards to the First Amendment, that this has nothing to do with editorial discretion because it's just the way that they, um, you know, that they prioritize content, that these services prioritize content, not that they associate with any specific messages. But of course, we know, you know, as First Amendment experts, um, that's not quite the case. These decisions that they that these services make with regards to the types of content that they tr choose to prioritize speaks to what the service itself wants to associate with and that in itself is a message so um you know that was kind of the first thing that i i, I found particularly uh bizarre um and then the second one has to do with the the actual design concerns and it seems to me in all of these cases there is a um suggestion that the services should just adopt chronological feeds and if they adopt chronological feeds then you know that's that's better than quote an algorithm of course chronological feeds um are algorithms in order to have a chronological feed but they're also they're also uh making these suggestions without any sort of evidence or um you know thought as to how chronological feeds are less likely to harm children than um algorithmically curated feeds and i find that to be kind of ironic as well because algorithmically Curated feeds are actually more likely to ensure that less harmful information is prioritized. So um, appreciate your thoughts on that. I'm going to move to uh, our next question here. It's, uh, I think, every on everybody's mind. Um, so is Section 230 dead? If these plaintiffs can just plead, it's not the underlying third party content, it's the design and operation of the service. Um, it sounds like these will successfully get by Section 230. Uh, I will throw it to Kathy to start. Um, I'm not going to declare it dead, um, but it's wounded. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's not doing what it needs to do, but what does that mean for our sake of, you know, rule of law in this country? That statute is not, I mean, it says what it says. It's not the most difficult or complex or unclear statute on our books. It's pretty straightforward. It tends to people don't like the answer that it gives and so therefore they're ignoring it um but if section 230 can be if that can make section 230 dead um we have a larger problem because that 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 tension between what congress does and what um you know any other court in the country chooses to recognize it is um a much bigger constitutional problem than just this so i'm inclined to think that it's just you know, for multiple reasons, including that I'm an optimist, um, I'm thinking it's just sort of ill at the moment. And, um, you know, this will go some rounds and eventually things will right themselves. And possibly to make lemonade out of this, the fact that everything has suddenly gone so crazy all at once, maybe 
you know, some evidence that can sort of help with the pushback. But um, it's not a good state of affairs, but, uh, you know, it's not dead letter. It's still on the books. It's still supposed to do something. So I look forward to all the really snazzy lawyers that made us going to hire to try to find some leverage somewhere to be able to push back. Professor Goldman. Uh, the way I teach it in class is that um, either the negligent design exception was a one-off from the Ninth Circuit in the specific case in which it came up that involved a very specific set of content authoring tools combined with reward for using those tools to engage in allegedly um, uh, risky behavior, um, or it's going to swallow up the entire rule and it's going to um, uh, be the workaround to Section 2 that the plaintiffs have wanted from the beginning. Um, they will always claim, as you pointed out, Jess, uh, they'll always claim negligent design. Um, that gets them around Section 230. We'll see if they that wins or not on the merits, but the bottom line is Section 230 no longer is doing the work. So it, the story is still being written, whether or not there is a broad-based negligent design exception to Section 230. That's not what the Ninth Circuit said in the case that, that created the exception in the first place, but that's certainly what plaintiffs want to hear, and that's what they're arguing in cases like the one at hand. Um, even if it's Section 230 still generally functions, the cases we're discussing today alone have the potential to radically reshape the complexion of the internet. Um, so one possible response is that the services decide they will just deploy uh, age verification to uh, reduce their risk liability and just get rid of all teens, um, uh, you know, all underage users. Just, you know, uh, there are too much risk. There's not enough profit. Get rid of them all. Um, and so at that point, if there's no longer that class of users online, it doesn't really matter whether or not Section 230 would protect the services from liability because literally the Internet has shrunk in a material way. Um, and certainly if it, there, the arguments that in, uh, social media services can addict users um, works, then the damages and potential co service configurations that flow from that conclusion will radically reshape the internet. Again, Section 230 won't necessarily be dead, but the internet will still look in entirely different. Um, the amount of money that's at stake, the way in which that's going to change behavior almost certainly will guarantee that the internet uh, is less functional than it is now. And so Section 230 may be dead by as a doctrinal matter. I hope it isn't. But even if it isn't, if it's even partially dead on one of the topics here, that alone could change the internet in a way that matters to Section 230. Um, excellent. Thank you both so much. We're going to go ahead and turn over to uh, the press and audience queues. I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask the questions from the chat. If you have a question, just feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with this first one here. Uh, do the panelists believe that COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act, raises some of the same legal um, slash constitutional defects that these lawsuits raise? I'll throw this to either of you. Yes. Um, and the only thing that uh, is sort of obviated if this comes from Congress is um, then it wouldn't really be everyone ignoring Section 230 as opposed to Congress effectively changing Section 230, although chances are they just drive a truck right through it. But um, so that would be bad and actually they'll break it and that would in some ways be worse. But it's a slightly different constitutional problem that is the correct legislative authority to be setting interstate commerce policy and any of these internet shaping things are interstate commerce shaping things. So it does belong. If anyone's going to screw it up, it is the job of Congress to do the screwing up. However, the problem with COSA is it indeed would screw up everything. Um, and I think in, yes, it implicates the, it, it definitely implicates the same constitutional problems. Um, you know, let's, let's ignore the Section 230 for a moment because essentially Congress can always undo Section 230 if it wants. But Section 230 didn't do a whole lot that the First Amendment didn't do on its own. And a lot of what COSA and these, like, you know, think of the children bills do is a huge affront to the First Amendment rights of children themselves. They have them, I mean, particularly teenagers. They have them and they need them. They are not, like, you know, they're not, like, 
the, they don't not get their, oh, congratulations, you're 18, you have the right to vote, and now you also you get your First Amendment rights. You had them before that. And something like COSA, where um, it's extracting personal information, um, so it's implicating anonymous speech, and not just for younger people, but also older people, because to prove that you're not 18, you have to give up a lot of information about yourself. I mean, that's dangerous. That's, that's a head-on First Amendment problem. These bills are also predicated on the idea that um, there are things that kids shouldn't read. And this is the equivalent of what, you know, book banners in Texas and Florida all want to do. Like, there are things that kids shouldn't read. And these bills are really built around the pretense of let's make sure that they can't then. It's about taking away content with them, and that affects their right to read. And it certainly affects their right to speak um, and form communities. Um, which is really important, not just communities where yeah, you do really want to be able to interact with the adult world, but they also need to be able to interact with communities where they can find support. And a lot of this presupposes like, well, the parents are absolutely, you know, perfect and wonderful and how dare, you know, the, the public world around it circumvent parental control. But we also need to realize that sometimes the parents themselves are the threat vector to kids. And, you know, these things are just sort of one, one size fits all of like nobody gets the right to speak freely on the internet and read content freely on the internet. And even if there's some perceived advantages to that, there's an awful lot of harm that comes from the very policy they're trying to do. And that just keeps getting ignored by anybody who thinks that these lawsuits or legislation trying to restrict the internet from younger people is in any way a good idea. It's not, and it's actually its own harm that needs to be measured and recognized unto itself. Professor Goldman? Yeah, if I can just add briefly, honestly, Kathy covered everything I would want to say. I'm just going to restate it slightly um, in my own words, but but uh, I agree with uh, Kathy's perspectives. Um, there's two different concerns I have with COSA. The first is anything that, that looks like a mandatory age authentication requirement, I think is unconstitutional. We will only know once the Supreme Court deals with this issue yet again, but this will not be the first time the Supreme Court has opined upon the matter. We have cases from the old days where they've already said you can't do that. Now, Costa tries to uh, waffle on this point by saying expressly, we are not requiring age authentication, but it creates a legal structure where there is no way to comply with that without doing age authentication. And so the fact that the drafters are playing games like that is, I think, really, you know, to me, makes me question their motivations. Um, they know they can't require age authentication, but they really want to require it. They have to they have to take a stand on that. And the way they've done it is, in my mind, not acceptable. Uh, the other thing is that we have a long history of legislatures trying to restrict children's access to constitutionally protected material. And to the extent that COSA does that again, um, we already know that they can't do that, um, that the Constitution prohibits um, uh, that kind of regulation of um, kids' access to constitutionally protected material. Um, and so from my perspective, I feel like it's just a deja vu. It's just a repackaging of things that have been tried and have failed over the years. The only reason why it gets the attention today is A, because so many co-sponsors, and B, because of the fact that we haven't had a modern Supreme Court opinion reiterating the principles. Now, of course, when the Supreme Court speaks, if they decide to disregard precedent as they have in other cases, um, we could be looking at an entirely different internet um, going forward. But until we get that point, it seems like the legislature, in this case, Congress, are just going straight in the front door of what they know they can't do, and they just don't care. And I'll flag one other specific. I believe uh, COSA would create a statutory duty of care owed for, by the platforms to the uh, to their users. And that is obviously something that is being uh, discussed in these each of these cases with regards to the negligence claims as well. So um, absolutely, I think th there will be some very obvious intersection between COSA and the challenges we're seeing today. And we need but to, I'm sorry, we, we need to be really clear about what it means for somebody in the expressive business to have a duty of care to a reader, an audience, something like that. I mean, we should find that revolting in the newspaper context, in the television context. Um, you know, we do have some case law buttressing the idea that it's revolting, and I hope that our constitutional sensibilities remain there. Um, but there is no coherent reason for why they would not apply 
in the internet context. If anything, they should apply more. And it's really troubling that they're applying less. There was one, just to go back to the um, one thing I saw in the uh, California, no, no, I'm sorry, the state attorney general's lawsuit. I was just looking through pages. And there's one thing that they complain about near the end about Meta doing its virtual reality um, program. And they complain that we have tried to investigate how Meta is going to build this expressive platform and they're not answering our inquiries. And I'm thinking, yeah, and the New York Times is not letting you come sit in their newsroom. Like, you, why would anybody think that trying to police somebody producing an expressive and the product or work product or service or something like that would be like, of course, we should have the police looking over their shoulder. That is odious under the Constitution and it should offend our sensibilities. And the, the fact that we're saying think of the children should not change that because they are also the people who will get hurt if we ignore the First Amendment on this. I'm sorry, Jess, if I can just append to Kathy's remark. Uh, I, we, we've said it a couple of times. I want to make it super express. Any idea about a duty of care towards an audience assumes that the audience has a homogeneous set of interests that can be sing catered to in a single way. But the reality is we know that social media users are not homogeneous in what they need from the services, what their experiences are with the services, and whether or not they benefit or are harmed. Uh, by the service. And so uh, creating a duty care is an impossible thing to comply with when the uh, protected individuals who are the beneficiaries of that duty um, have heterogeneous and potentially conflicting needs. Um, and so anyone who's arguing this, I think, just just masks or, or you know, uh, washes away um, the impossibility of catering to a heterogeneous community in a single form. So you're saying there's no such thing as a reasonable internet user? Um. Well, there can be, but you know, uh, to be clear, um, you know, uh, everyone is hurt, uh, you know, at risk of uh, being hurt if there's a tripping hazard, and the physical injuries that can flow from that are not going to materially differ among the users, such that we say if there's a tripping hazard, we expect you to take care of it. That's standard negligence. But when it comes to speech, some speech might hurt some and. Therefore, we can't simply assume that we can get the, you know, we can we can make everyone better off without making anyone worse off. So that's a key distinction between stuff like negligence claims over personal injuries versus you know, uh, uh, claims based on speech based harms when the speech based harms might also have been a benefit to somebody else. Excellent. Moving on to the uh, next question here. I think this is the question that's on everybody's minds as we pick through this. Um, on the meta state lawsuits, what do you make of the approach by state AGs of collectively filing a joint federal suit, a flurry of suits in state courts, and one separate state suit in federal court? And could you talk about what you see as the key differences here? I'll throw that to Kathy. I mean, I think it's throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks and also um you know, if you throw enough, eventually something will get through, whether it should get through or not. So it just sort of seems like a, a bit of a DDoS, a denial of service attack on the platforms themselves, just to drown them with different litigation strategy. I would like to believe that this will blow up on them. Um, there have been other instances where when grandstanding AGs get together, they don't actually litigate very well. Um, I'm thinking of a really poor um, amicus brief they filed in um, the Woodhull challenge of the FOSTA statute where, you know, the, the, the issue before the court was whether there was standing. And the whole question there was like whether, um, whether there was a real risk to the plaintiffs if, the, if FOSTA got enforced. And the, the court, the district court had said, no, there's no real risk. It had agreed with the Department of Justice and it said, oh, well, there, there's no real risk. And then all these attorney generals got together and swooped in with an amicus brief to say, we are totally going after, you know, people like the plaintiffs. We just haven't started yet, which was like they were trying to defend the law, but that was a really bad way to do it because that was not the issue before the court. So I'm hoping that this is nothing but Keystone Cops and the grandstanding will eventually bite them in the butt. But I don't like this. But it, it's also sort of like if you've got that much unanim unanimity among like, let's say the states all agree, then why are we not going to Congress? Like, the whole point of Congress is that, like, when states agree on stuff, like, 
that's the organ that can start producing things. So this is, they're looking for weak spots. There's been those previous cases that have seemingly created weak spots in uh, section 230 and things like that, and they are going to exploit it. And um, I really hope they don't succeed because um, it's dangerous and, you know, and let's think about who these states are. There's some really weird bedfellows wrapped up in, in this litigation, and that should be sort of exhibit A for why it is a problem, because surely the policy interests of a blue state and a red state about what kids can read are not the same. And, um, you know, if they're all of a sudden pressing for the same law, you know, tease that out a little bit. That's not going to work out for either any of these states' interests, let alone their kids. Uh, I'm just going to add uh, that I'm actually interested in the answer to the question myself. It's a great question, and um, I'm a little curious if we've heard from the uh, state AGs about why they chose to play this uh, the game this way. Uh, but honestly, I think a lot of the discussion ties back to Kathy's earliest discussion about MDLs. Um, the fact that there are now these multiple litigations in different venues in parallel with each other creates some gamesmanship and potentially conflicting or adverse results consequences. If I'm meta, actually, this creates an opportunity for me. What I would do is I would look at the place where I thought I could get the best result fastest, and I would lean on trying to push that one ahead of all the others, try to get a, a favorable precedent there, and then shop that back to the other litigations uh, and say, look, uh, this issue's already been resolved. Um, so there's a bunch of opportunities and duplicative costs that are created by this. And um, I, I don't really know why they chose to do it that way. To me, it also raises the question whether or not they really do, the, the state AGs really do agree, agree with each other about what they want. And that may be a reinforcement to get to Kathy's point that, in fact, each of them has their own interest about what they want to happen. Um, and they couldn't find a way to put it all into a single litigation. Also, one other thing looking at it is that case is full of supplemental litigate, uh, supplemental claims. Um, it's got one federal claim, the COPPA claim, and the whole point of that is so they can get it into federal courts without doing diversity jurisdiction. And then from there, they've tacked on to whatever state claims they've got. And it is weird to see this one piece of federal lit litigation also have, and under Wisconsin law, and under California law, and under this state law and that state law, um, these laws aren't identical. Um, some states like have one, some states have two. It, this is, I'm looking at that and that just seems strange and sort of like not how the system is probably supposed to work and probably for very good reason. There may be, as Eric was saying, like some interesting upsides and benefits that the, the defendants can game out of that, but it is weird. But it also, I think, means that if the COPPA claim goes away, this falls out of federal court and then turns into a whole bunch of state litigation which is its own headache um, for any a number of other reasons. Uh, but that's where Section 230 and its preemption provision should also make it go away. I'll also add that I find it rather interesting that um, among the AGs is also AG Bonta in California, even though the age appropriate design code, which was supposed to, uh, you know, was aimed to cure all of the things that these uh, services are being uh, alleged to have been doing to kids. Um, hasn't even gone into effect yet. Uh, so is it a sign that AG Bonta doesn't think that the law is the right avenue, the California law is the right avenue? Um, or maybe that, you know, there's some concerns about the net choice, the current net choice challenge as well. Um, moving on to our next question and reminder to our audience, please feel free to continue putting uh, questions into the chat. You can also raise your hand and we can call on you, go off mute and, and ask, that, ask a question that way as well. So our next question, I've heard governors and AGs compare litigation against social media companies to previous lawsuits against the tobacco and opioid industries. They argue they have an obligation to hold online slash social media companies to account for alleged harms to young people. I'm curious to hear the panelists' thoughts on the comparison to previous multi-state legal actions against large industries. Also curious about your take on the states asserting a consumer protection role when it comes to the tech industry. Does Section 230 and or the First Amendment completely inoculate tech platforms from state action? Or are there legitimate legal avenues that states can and should or can slash should pursue in your view? Um, Professor Goldman, I'm going to throw this to you. So uh, the, the approach to litigation that we're seeing 
uh, the MDL, uh, the effort to find multiple types of plaintiffs um, and to roll up as many of them into a single massive lawsuit does take a playbook out of some of the prior high stakes industry defining litigation that we've seen in the past, like battles over things like tobacco. Um, so from my perspective, you know, it seems like the plaintiff's lawyers are using a playbook that they've developed in previous litigation and treating the same way. It's it's hard for me to wrap my head around that because there's such a big difference between something like tobacco and something like speech um, that we we just they're not even comparable. You know, one's a physical product, the other is uh, an intangible. One it has uh, only health detriment. It has no health benefits. The other could, has this mixed audience that where there might be some people who benefit, some people who don't. There might be situations where only the audience benefits. Like, who knows? Um, but it's not the same kind of categorical negative effect on society the way that, uh, you know, I'm sorry, speech doesn't have that negative categorical effect on society the way that something like a, uh, a tobacco usage uh, does. Um, so it, it follows the same playbook, but it actually, I think, highlights the fact that that playbook should not be used when we're dealing with items that have this kind of mixed benefit or potentially only categorical benefit um, in society like speech. Um, so I, I hope we'll someday grow out of analogizing between tobacco and speech or oil and speech or some of the other kinds of analogies that we've seen where really you know, the, uh, to me, that's a tell on the person who's making the analogy that they probably actually don't really understand the different market drivers, the different social benefits and costs. And in many cases, the reason why they may not understand is because they are so focused on trying to advance a censorship agenda that they actually want the same consequences. They want to eliminate tobacco in our society and they want to eliminate speech in our society. It's actually the same playbook. If your goal is censorship, this is a way to do so. Um, I do want to answer the second part of the question, which was regarding the role of consumer protection laws as applied to um, internet services. Um, unquestionably, internet services have to comply with general uh, applicability uh, consumer protection laws. The, the, no one is debating otherwise. Um, but the problem is that we've seen over and over again, particularly the state AGs, weaponize standard general purpose consumer protection laws as a way of trying to control the speech uh, on the service for the censorship benefit. And when we see that, we should be horrified, right? Because now not only are they trying to advance an unconstitutional objective uh, censorship, but they're lying to us. They're saying we're just in fact enforcing consumer protection, but what they're really doing is using that as a pretext. Um, and so it's the pretextual censorship agenda that bothers me when I see these claims, which unfortunately, most of the ones I've seen actually fit that model. And so um, that's, I think, part of why there's so much reservation about empowering state AGs with more power because of the fact that they've already shown how they'll abuse the existing power they have. We are actually running low on time here. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it here. Thank you both so much for taking the time to answer some of these questions. Obviously, there's a lot to keep an eye on here between the federal MDL, the uh, California state suit, um, and the AG suits. Uh, so we will, you know, I'm sure all of us will continue writing and keeping folks updated uh, as developments uh, come out. I wanted to go ahead and give you uh, both some final you know, closing statements. Uh, Kathy, I'll go to you. I think a big takeaway, and it's um, I agree with every, everything Eric said on that previous question. Um, the the second part of it is does this does Section two hundred and thirty and and or the First Amendment completely inoculate tech pl platforms from state action? Uh, they don't seem well inoculated at the moment because this is all falling on their heads, but it should because, like Eric said, this is not a thing. This is speech, and these are people who are helping us talk to each other. And if they can't be in the business of helping us talk to each other, we're not going to be able to talk to each other. And that's uh, an end that we really shouldn't be happily inviting. This is something we should be resisting and um, making sure that you know, as courts look at things, as policymakers look at things, that it's really understood that, you know, for good or bad, people say things that are sometimes good and sometimes bad, but the way to deal with the harmful ones is 
carefully and address to whatever has gone wrong. But when you start to pass paint with a broad brush, this idea of we can control this dynamic of expression of reading and writing and exchanging and connecting and think that this is something that we can sanction into some perfect universe where everybody will be all happy and healthy. A, that's not an end that's achievable and B, this is no way to even come close to it. Um, we have to remember that this is speech and that the First Amendment exists for a reason because that's not the sort of thing that is subject to policy control or ever can be subject to policy control and still have a free society. So um, yeah, uh, say no to all of this. Um, I'm gonna make uh, two concluding remarks. Uh, first, I'm gonna just riff on the point about addiction and use as an exemplar of some of the difficult conversations that are buried in this um, uh, litigation um, that I, I honestly, I, I don't think anyone really knows how to answer. So let's just talk about the idea that social media addicts users. We have questions like, what does it mean to be addicted? Who decides if it's an addiction um, or if it's something else? Um, who caused the addiction and how do we allocate that when a user might be engaging in multiple social media services all at the same time? How do we allocate responsibility for that addiction? Um, and then the most important piece is how would a service know which users are likely to be addicted, which ones are likely to consume at a reasonable amount, and which users need to consume a certain amount in order to get the social benefits that they seek? Um, and there's an opacity to the identification of which users might be at risk that really, I think, pervades this entire question. And if the answer is, then just don't serve anybody, I think that's going to be the wrong answer on multiple fronts. And it throws a number of communities that depend on social media in order to advance their goals. It, it, it basically pits them against these other users and said, we're just going to, we don't care about the benefits you're getting. We're just going to get rid of those. Um, so the whole idea about addiction buries a bunch of really thorny social questions um, that I don't think we know how to answer. And to the last question that we got, the point is that courts are in a terrible position to do that kind of balancing of interest. That's what legislators are supposed to do, to say, we know that there's going to be trade-offs between these communities, and we're going to pick one community to win and another community to lose. That's a legislature decision. That should never be a court decision. The uh, other concluding remark I'll just uh, make is that Underlying the litigation that we're discussing today and some of the other issues like COSA um, is this broad based question of how do we keep our children safe online? And if we reach the conclusion that services cannot be compelled to, to, to uh, authenticate the uh, age of their users and then segregate kids from adults, and we take all policy tools off the table that are predicated on the idea you can segregate kids online and then give them special treatment then what we're gonna do is what we should be doing today already, which is having a much bigger conversation about how do we help kids self-actualize in the modern world? What tools do they need? What role does online uh, tool do online tools play in advancing those needs? Um, what are the risks that are posed by having early access to technology? What are the risks that some users are going to overconsume or quote, become addicted or experience other harms? And who's gonna help the kids achieve the right balance for themselves? Is it the parents, the schools? Is it the community? Is it the, uh, uh, the, the services? Is it uh, all of the above? And it's that last idea that it takes a village to raise the children that I think is often buried in these policy discussions. The idea is we'll wave a magic wand, internet services are gonna fix the problem, and we've done our job as regulators, to me is really quite offensive. It's like not at all close to the likely outcome that we're gonna need. And so there's a really hard conversation about how to help kids get the best of the internet without uh, experiencing some of the avoidable harms. And that cannot be done with these kind of glib magic wand type litigations or legislation. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you to all of the attendees as well who joined us today. Um, as I said, we will be keeping you all updated as more developments uh, continue in these cases. But for now, thank you all so much.